Calling case number 16-MD-2741, In Re Roundup Products Liability Litigation. Counsel, please step forward and state your appearances for the record. Good morning, Your Honor. Amy Wagstaff, and with me I have Jennifer Moore, Robin Greenwald, Brian Brake, Catherine Forge, Dina Beach, and Tesfaya Tosik. Um, okay, should we have a chat about um, Fortier, or should we do that after we're, we're done with the witness today? Uh, why, don't we, why don't we have a chat about it now? Um, so, you know, the, I don't remember the exact schedule that you all proposed for um, my presiding over his trial testimony, um, and I don't know if Monsanto agrees to that procedure at, at all. Um, I'm concerned that that, uh, that 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 those times are not going to work for me, and and so. But but, but let me ask first: um, is, is does is Monsanto amenable to that procedure? <laughs> okay. Now, and and you used a, a a word there, which was deposition, and I I guess that I I don't know if that's the right word to describe what the plaintiffs are. Proposing, however, it does make me wonder if this should be treated as a deposition. So my first thought was, could we use Fortier's existing deposition testimony? And I suspect the answer to that is no, because it was not given. If, among other things, it was not given with the idea that there would be a phased trial. Right. Well, right. Not only that, but we don't ask the questions in the deposition. It's really right. Monsanto asking. Dr. Well, Portier, yeah, but the questions. But that, ha that, that often happens when a witness is unavailable. You use the deposition testimony, even though it's primarily the defendant asking questions, right? So, so I mean, that begs the question. But I, I assume okay. that the bigger deal is that it would be very hard to separate out specific, I mean, sorry, causation. Um, well, his testimony is only supposed to be about causation, but my sense is that he brings into his opinion a lot of the stuff that I would not understand as strictly being about causation. Right. There, so, are, there are a lot of questions about European issues and about bans and lack of bans. That's right. There's a lot of that. Um, and also, it wasn't really a preservation deposition. So I, I, would, I would say that it would be unusual for that type of deposition to be trial testimony. And we didn't think of it as a deposition. We thought of it as trial testimony okay. that's remote. Well, in, in any event, I, it struck me that it would be unlikely that that deposition right. testimony could be used. But why not just do another um, deposition or quasi-deposition where you are um, – Perhaps you, perhaps the plaintiffs do get to um, start, even though usually the defense, you know, the opposite side starts in the deposition. Plaintiffs do get to start. The, de the defendants can can cross examine him. It's not with me presiding remotely, much as I'd love to go to Australia um, and in different in in you know, if it were if my schedule were a little different, I'd actually welcome the opportunity to go, but. But I, I can't do it right now. Um, um, but why not just have this be a deposition, and you, lo you you know you lodge your objections as you would during the deposition, but you separate it out, you know, into the stuff that Fortier would testify about in phase one versus mm -hmm. phase two, to the best of your ability, um, given the guidance that I've provided thus far, um, and. Uh, and, and then you can you can designate the portions of his deposition that you believe should be played at trial. And if there are any evidentiary issues I need to resolve, 
either you know at the pretrial conference or after the pretrial conference, whatever, I can do that. I mean, I, I, it, it's, I'd like to talk to my colleagues for a moment, Your Honor, maybe get a break, but it, it sounds like that's something we could work it out. I, obviously, it's a lot to ask you to be present. Um, well, I mean, I, I would be happy to do it normally. Well, in short this, notice. <laughs> the, just this, the schedule is already filled. Right, and know? the time difference with Australia is such that it, yeah. we don't really have a lot of flexibility with time. Maybe he doesn't. Maybe he. Sh maybe he shouldn't be the first witness. You mean being the first witness in the sense that you're going to be taking that testimony before the r the rest of the trial begins, or first witness in the sense that he's the w first witness that the plaintiffs want to put on. That's correct. Well, that may need to change. I mean, the, this logistical issue may may make it so that the plaintiffs need to reorder their presentation because, it, you know, depending on – I mean, if you're talking about, you know, having – what was it? The third day of his testimony was going to be the day of jury selection? No, the first day. First day was going to be the day of jury selection. Well, then you – I think you probably will have to reorder your presentation because – um, it may be that you are not able to sift through the testimony and figure out what you want to designate and get ev any evidentiary rulings from me on what it is appropriately designated by the time you begin putting on your case. So you, you're probably going to need to change the order. So one option, and maybe we could do this at a break, Your Honor, we can talk with Monsanto's counsel, is um, maybe move it up a little bit instead of starting. If you're not going to preside anyway, we were thinking about your schedule. So if we don't have to factor in your schedule, maybe we could move it earlier, and that would allow us the opportunity to do designations. So in other words, if we moved it up a day or two. But, so but we'll, look, maybe we can take a break and talk about it and address it again, okay. if that's okay. Okay. That sounds good. Right, and we can. Yeah. We were planning on starting at eight to accommodate the California difference. So eight o'clock in the morning in Australia is one o'clock here, so that we would make sure we do it so that it's normal hours and not the middle of the night for you. That sounds. That sounds okay. like a good middle ground. Um, speaking of, you were talking about seven hours, five right. hours, six hours, six hours. Um, uh, it seems like you. Um, it seems like we. It, it, that, this is a good time to talk about time limits for the trial um, because I'm, I'm not sure you're going to want to spend uh, 12 hours on Dr. Portier's testimony. So what I'm, what I'm looking at, so I, you know, I, I, I could potentially revisit this at the pretrial conference after I've gotten into it more deeply, but I've now started to get into it um, and um, have, have started to read all the papers and um, – my tentative view is that the, the time limits should be six, uh, tw uh, 32 hours for each side, 32 hours of airtime for each side. Usually we have about a, um, a four hours of airtime each trial day. It actually is usually a little bit more than four hours, but um, <laughs> and we would be going for uh, – days per week um, and so on on that I will admit that there's a little bit of reverse engineering here but I also think that that 
it, you know, this is a reasonable amount of time for each side to put on its case, um, that 32 hours for each side will, will make for a four-week trial. And the idea would be that, that that would include opening statements and closing arguments, and it would be up to each side to decide how much time to spend um, on uh, opening statements and closing arguments. Now, what I, what I, as, as is always the case with civil trials, if I determine, let's say, a quarter of the way through the trial or something, if I determine that the parties are using their time efficiently, um, and I feel that I've squeezed them too much, I can give you extra time. Um, uh, and it, I, I will say that in, I, I, it, of all my civil trials, that's, that has happened once, where I've given, I've given um, each side some extra time. But usually, um, I feel like my estimates are, are pretty right on, and the parties end up using less time than they've been given. Um, so, so that's, you know, like I said, we can have a further discussion about it at the pretrial conference, but you, the parties should operate under the assumption that it, they are getting 32 hours per side. And it, are you considering that for both phase one and phase two? Yes. Okay. Um, and are you... And, it, and, and I think it would be up to the parties. I mean, we can, we can talk more about this at the pretrial conference. It, if it, if it makes sense to have time limits for phase one, separate time limits for phase one and phase two, you know, we can talk about that. But I was kind of assuming that, again, it would be up to the parties to decide how to use their time between phase one and phase two. Okay. So I will take your comments back to my team, and, and we'll be ready to talk about it on the 13th. Okay. Um, one oh my more. God! I hope I didn't give more time than what you requested, <laughs> but uh, but that's my honest, you know, assessment at this stage anyway of what what I think would be appropriate. Uh, one more question: um, Are you intending after we get a verdict on phase one to start phase two the next morning, or do you anticipate a period of time between them, or just in terms of preparation? I don't anticipate a period of time between them, and if okay. they if there's a verdict on phase one at 10 a.m then I would expect, you know, you to be begin your opening statements on phase two, you know, later that day. Okay. Okay. Shall we proceed? I think um, Dr. Nabhan is here, Your Honor. Um, I don't know. Come on up, Dr. Namban. Shadi Nabhan. C H A D I N A B H A N. Good morning. Hello again. May I proceed, Your Honor? May. Good morning, Dr. Navan. Good morning. Uh, just as a housekeeping matter, I think you have your three reports in front of you. Is that right? Yes, I do. Okay, so what, um, you also have some binders in front of you, and um, binder volume one of three is labeled exhibit. So I'm going to just move into the record those three reports. Yes, I do. Okay. No so objection. The, no objection. So noted. So those are, for the record, exhibit, the first tab is exhibit 2000 is the Hardiman report. The second tab, 2001, is the Zabayi report. And the third tab, 2002, is the Keith report. And Dr. Navan, you wrote all three of those reports yourself, correct? I did. And you did, uh, you previously have testified in a Daubert proceeding in this court, right? I did. And you reviewed the court's opinion at, that, that came out after that proceeding, correct? I did. Including um, the opinion with respect to your, the opinions you had offered at the general causation phase, right? Yes. That, you had read that opinion prior to writing these three reports, correct? 
Yes. So why don't we use, just as an example, the Hardeman report, which is Exhibit 2000, but you can use the version that you have in front of you. Okay. And in that report, starting on page five, to include a discussion about exposure to pesticides at the bottom, a paragraph at the bottom of that page, correct? Yes, I do. And that discussion was also in your general causation report. Do you recall that? I don't recall if it was exactly the same words, but I did obviously discuss that. You discussed that, that meta-analysis by Shinasi and Leon, correct? It's amongst the other things I've discussed. It was one of the things I discussed at the time. Correct. And you also are aware that in that discussion there is a mistake, correct? Yeah, the uh, third line from the bottom, it's the odds ratio for B cell lymphoma, and uh, somehow it's, uh, it was BLBCL. That's right. That's the one. So just to read that sentence, it says, this meta-analysis found an association between glyphosate and B cell lymphoma with an odds ratio 2.0, and then puts the confidence interval, correct? Yes. And that is in that paper, right? It is in the meta-analysis. And then you go on to say, and this was the same odds ratio for DLBCL, correct? Yes. In that meta-analysis, they looked at the various types, and the B-cell lymphoma amongst the non-Hodgkin lymphoma had the same odds ratio. And I wrote here DLBCL, but I actually meant B-cell lymphoma. Well, in the prior section, you, meant, you said B-cell lymphoma, right? Right? Yes. The, yes. So when you then went said, and this was the same odds ratio for DLBCL, there was no odds ratio specific to DLBCL, correct? Yes, this was inadvertent. Okay. Now, if you turn to the next page of your report, page six, you then go on to discuss the IR classification, correct? Yes, I do discuss it. That was also a part of your general causation opinions, right? Again, amongst other things, yes. You go on to discuss the McDuffie paper. That was part of your general causation opinions, correct? Yes. If you turn the page, you discussed Darus 2003. That was also, among other things, part of your general causation discussion, correct? Yes, I mean, some of the things I've discussed then may be a little bit different than how I discussed it now, but yes, I discussed it back then and now. And the same with Erickson, correct? Correct. And for Erickson, you cite the unadjusted odds ratio of 2.36, unadjusted for other pesticides, correct? Correct. And that paper contains an odds ratio that is adjusted for other pesticides, correct? Yes. And you did not include that in this report, right? Right, but this, this Erickson paper is actually more important for the dose exposure and the response exposure. This is really why it's very critical. It actually shows that the more exposure you get, the more likely you are going to get non-Hodgkin lymphoma. So that's actually the critical part of, uh, of uh, the Erickson paper. In addition to that, whenever you have a dose response, it actually overcomes the possibility of confounding factors causing a problem. In other words, if the confounders would actually reduce the odds ratio, then you, don't, you wouldn't see the dose exposure or the response exposure. So I understand your explanation, Dr. Napan, but that wasn't my question. My question was you did not discuss the adjusted odds ratio in this report, right? I didn't discuss it, no. Okay. We're going to talk a lot about the two days in the Sure. Okay. And here, it's your testimony that you are – Despite what we just went over, you are not offering any general causation opinions, correct? I'm not offering general causation, but obviously I've reviewed the literature extensively and I've testified in general causation, so I'm very familiar with the literature, and it obviously factored in somehow in how I included Roundup as a possible risk in these patients. Okay, so, these, so your understanding of the general causation is relevant to your specific causation opinions? Well, it will have to be relevant because I'm trying to look at all the risk factors for each patient. Okay. Now, one thing I just want to put um, testify, or put up front is you've also offered specific causation opinions in other cases beyond the three that we're here today about, correct? I have. And in all of those cases, you've used the same methodology, right? I use the same methodology, which is similar methodology that I've done in clinical practice, as well as when I write 
peer-reviewed articles, and I have over 300 papers I've written. It's always the same critical methodology in how I analyze any, any case of these cases. Right. And you call that here in this context the differential diagnosis or a differential etiology, right? Differential etiology, I think, is more appropriate because we're looking at the etiology, obviously, and the causation. So differential etiology, although I understand that sometimes from the legal term, differential diagnosis is used as well. Okay. I was going to ask you that. You agree that differential diagnosis or is a legal term, correct? Yeah, I mean, differential diagnosis from a, from a clinician standpoint, we, you know, that's when you have somebody that presents to your clinic with symptoms and you're trying to do the diagnosis. So you look at various possibilities that may uh, present with similar symptomatology. And differential etiology, you are trying to look at what the etiology of whatever that symptom may be. So you're looking at differential etiology. I understand that they may be used synonymously here, but I'm just trying to explain the differences from a clinician standpoint. So in these reports, when you see differential diagnosis or differential etiology, you have these are used synonymously from my standpoint. Right, but just to be clear, differential diagnosis is a is legal terminology from your standpoint, right? That's not what I said. I said when you see them in these reports, it is used for, for legal terminology. But differential diagnosis is when any patient presents to a clinician with symptoms, through your mind, you have to think of what might be causing these symptoms until you reach a diagnosis. So I think a differential etiology is probably more appropriate term when you look at causation and the etiology of, these, uh, of what caused the lymphoma of these patients. I would never testify in this court that you guys were mistaken. I wouldn't do that. <laughs> I know better. <laughs> but maybe you should have consulted us. I would make a good expert witness. <laughs> okay, now you talked about your clinical practice. Uh, Dr. Nabhan, it's true that in your clinical practice, you have never told a patient that his or her non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, lymphoma was caused by glyphosate or Roundup, correct? This is true. Now, for all three of the plaintiffs, um, Mr. Hardiman, Ms. Stevick, and Mr. Gabayu, you have no tests to determine what level, if any, of glyphosate was in their system at the time of their cancer diagnoses, right? I don't. None of these tests were performed on any of these plaintiffs. And you're aware that for all three plaintiffs, they stop using Roundup they've testified that they've, or told you even, that they stopped using Roundup years before their cancer diagnoses, correct? Yeah, several years. I mean, give and take. Each one is a little bit different. Okay. But all of them had, had clearly, give or take years, they had stopped using Roundup, and then give or take years later, they had their NHL diagnoses, correct? That's correct. And you would have serious doubts that the cause of an individual's lymphoma was glyphosate if there was not glyphosate in his or her system at the time of his cancer diagnosis, correct? I don't know the answer to that. I, again, I think when you look at the studies, many of these studies, the epidemiologic literature that linked uh, glyphosate to uh, non-Hodgkin lymphoma, they actually did not test uh, patients or looked at serum levels or urine levels. The, you have to you have to look at the evidence based on what's published in the epidemiologic literature. So much of this did not look at serum levels and actual concentration in patients that, that were found to have non-Hodgkin lymphoma after being exposed. Okay, so Dr. Nahan, um, the big binder, the middle binder, is volume two of three and has some of your prior testimony. Which one? The, the middle binder of the three. And if you go to the fourth tab that's labeled 2035, do you see that? Yes. Okay, and this is in a case um, Adams versus Monsanto, correct? Yes. And this involved a plaintiff named Miss Gordon, correct? Yes. And you were deposed in this case on November 15th, 2018, right? Correct. 
Okay, so I'd like you to turn to page 188 of this deposition. And if you want to look back at page 187 for the context, you're being asked in Ms. Gordon's case about the possibility of her glyphosate levels being zero at the time of her diagnosis, okay? Which page, I'm sorry? Page look, at page, look at page 187, starting at line nine. Okay. Yeah, I can see that. Okay, and now I want you to read page 188, lines five through 12. This was your testimony under oath, correct? Yeah, you, you, were asked, you were asked, that is correct. If there's no presence of glyphosate in her body at the time she's diagnosed with lymphoma, you wouldn't be able to say that glyphosate was a cause of her lymphoma, correct? Yeah, but that doesn't mean in the serum. I mean, you could be exposed in the skin, you could inhale it. I mean, we don't know all of the studies that looked at how patients usually get brown or glyphosate did not necessarily measure blood or serum. You know, the level of exposure or how these patients are being exposed is various. So we don't know. Sometimes it's aerial spray and people could inhale it or could just be exposed on the skin. So, I mean, you asked me whether it's in the blood or the serum, and we don't know if these patients had any of this checked. I, I just, just, I want to read the question and answer and see if this was your answer. If there's no presence of glyphosate in her body, regardless of how she, whether it was through the skin or inhalation or otherwise, if there's no presence of glyphosate in her body at the time she's diagnosed with lymphoma, you wouldn't be able to say that glyphosate was a cause of her lymphoma, correct? And your answer was, I would have serious doubts about it, yes, right? Right, but the, I need to explain. In her body, at some point, will, somebody will have the actual um, offending hazard in the body. It doesn't have to be necessarily, at some point to a 20 year, you would have had glyphosate in the body. It may not necessarily happen the day when you are diagnosed, but you could have had it 10 years before. You could have had it five years <coughs> before, and the damage has already been done. That's how I understood the question. At some point, the, at some point through a 20 year of being exposed to a particular compound, you would have, you must have had the offending material in the body. It doesn't have to be the day you were diagnosed or the year before you were diagnosed. That we don't know, but at some point, it was present in the body. And most of the studies don't really look at that because you don't, you don't actually, you can't look at thousands of patients and measure the serum for each particular person. You didn't give any of those explanations when you were asked about Ms. Gordon, right? Oh, I mean, nobody asked me to explain exactly what that is, but that's, that's exactly what is implied. Okay. All right. I mean, when we give chemotherapy, the chemotherapy is in the blood, right? We don't always check the level of chemotherapy unless we need to but it is present and then it disappears from the body after we finish chemotherapy. But the passable toxicity is that happened with chemotherapy years later occurred despite the fact that chemotherapy is not in the blood and it's already gone, but you're exposed to it. So at some point throughout your medical journey or whatever you've been doing, you would be exposed to these compounds or material and if you test, you will find them. They just don't need to be tested the day of diagnosis or the year before the diagnosis. Right, but Ms. Ms. Gordon also used Roundup for several years, right? She did. Yep. And then you were asked if at the time of her cancer diagnosis, glyphosate was not in her body, would you be, would you, would you be able to say that glyphosate was a cause? And you said, I, have serious, I would have serious doubts. That was yeah. your answer, well, right? I'm explaining to you what I meant by the answer, and I'm explaining to you that at some point, you will find the actual compound in the body if you look for it. Most people don't have a standardized test to look for it, and they have not. And at some point throughout the journey, you will see it. You just don't know when. Uh, Dr. Nathan, let's talk about the two days and the 10 days that you referenced earlier. Your, for, for your methodology, you are looking at two studies to determine whether there has been sufficient exposure to say that glyphosate is a risk factor for each of the three individuals, right? That, that's not the only thing I look for for my methodology. That's actually incorrect. That is, some of the studies I looked for for my methodology, but for my methodology, I looked at way more studies than just, just these two studies. Okay. 
We didn't ask me what I looked for, but this is just part of the what I looked for. Okay, you can agree that part of what you looked for was was how many days the three plaintiffs had to be exposed to Roundup under the Erickson study and the McDuffie study, correct? So uh, yes, I mean this is part of what I looked for in my in determining my methodology, correct? Okay, and one of those studies tells you two days per year, correct? Yes. And one of those studies tells you 10 lifetime days, correct? Correct. More, more than two days per year and more than 10 days for lifetime. Okay. And you would look to see for all three plaintiffs whether his or her exposure fits within those criteria, two days per year, more than two days per year, and or more than 10 lifetime days, correct? So as part of the methodology, when you are looking at glyphosate specifically and you are ruling in or ruling out glyphosate, you, you, you look at the all epidemiology literature that's part of it, not just these two studies, and then you look at the level of exposure as determined by previously published epidemiologic studies, such as the Erickson paper and the McDuffie paper. And both of them just give you an estimate. We don't know what the minimum exposure that we actually need to have, but we know that if somebody is exposed more than two days per year or more than 10 days per lifetime, their risk of developing non-Hodgkin lymphoma doubles. So that is important. And so in that case, you then ruled in glyphosate or Roundup as a potential contributing cause to each of the plaintiff's lymphomas, correct? Part of the way to rule it in will have to be level of exposure that is compatible with what is published in the epidemiologic literature. So yes, that was, that was an important piece of the puzzle that I had to look, and that's why I talked to them, and I read their depositions, and I looked at their exposure history, but what, that was not the only piece that I looked for. I want to make sure I that this is clear. I think you have said that several times now, and I'm not saying it's the only piece but you looked for each of the three of them and then compared their exposure to the, whether it was more than two days per year or more than 10 lifetime days, correct? Yes, and the three of them had substantially more than either cutoff uh, of these two papers. Right, and then that would, was what you needed to show that glyphosate as a risk factor was truly impacting the development of their diseases, correct? Again, yes, part of what I needed. It's not the only thing that I needed. It was part of what I needed. You have to look at each case with other risk factors that they have and other things that they have in order for me to determine the causation. Well, let's look at the same deposition we were just looking at, so the Adams deposition, and turn to page 105, lines 8 through 22. Page? 105 of Exhibit 2035. Are you with me? Yep. And you were asked, okay, how, what is the extent of the exposure that someone has to have in order for you to determine that Roundup caused their cancer? Not number of days, but whatever you said, the magnitude of exposure or. And your answer was, yeah. To me, I have to see that the exposure in that particular patient that I'm, in that I'm assessing is in line with what is published in the epidemiologic literature, such as the one that you showed me. So more than two days per year or more than 10 days per lifetime. These are two particular aspects of the exposure that I will need to see in order for me to show that the risk factor is truly impacting the development of disease. That was your testimony, correct? Yes. That's what I just said. Okay. And once you have made that determination, and if, if you don't believe there are other risk factors, then you can't dismiss Roundup as a risk factor or a substantial cause for a particular patient, right? You can't dismiss it if somebody had a level of exposure, but you have to look at other risk factors for each particular patient because it may not be the only factor. They may be more than other factors. You have to look at every single contributing factor and determine which one probably the most substantial of each particular individual. So mm -hmm. in each particular case, 
you look at all the risk factors that I have known over the years that they contribute to the development of non-Hodgkin lymphoma through taking care of thousands of patients and through my clinical practice, as well as um, including Roundup. And the reason Roundup is included in this is based on all of the epidemiologic literature that you talked about and already reviewed a couple of years ago. If, Dr. Navhan, if a patient fits within the epidemiological literature that you, that you have said links Roundup to non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and if there are not other risk factors, then you are, will not dismiss Roundup as a substantial contributing factor in a particular patient, right? You can dismiss it automatically. You'll have to look at each case individual, but yes, you cannot dismiss it automatically and ignore a risk factor. It's like, you know, if, if you have somebody with lung cancer and is a smoker, you can't dismiss smoking. You'd have to put it on the list because you know smoking causes lung cancer. So you have you can't dismiss it. No. Okay. And if the, and I want to be clear, then once it's in, right, it's it's been ruled in in your analysis, correct? If it fits within the epidemiological literature, correct? Yes. And if there are no other what you would say causative risk factors. So we're, let's put aside age and gender, but no other causative I, risk. I disagree that age causes cancer, but we can talk about that later. Right. I know you disagree, and that's why I'm putting it to the side. So let's say there are no other what you would call causative risk factors. Then you are going to say that Roundup was the substantial contributing factor in that individual's lymphoma. I'll have to look at each individual case separately, but I would rule it in, and I will have to look at each particular patient before I can rule it out. Yes, I mean, it will be part of the, you know, you, you, you're more inclusive. You have to be very inclusive in all of the cases, but the hypothetical example that you provided will make me rule Roundup in, and then I will look at each particular patient to rule it out or keep it in. Right, but so could I ask a follow-up question on that? Sure. So two things. First, try to slow down a little bit, though I appreciate how fast we're going because it saves time and can help with sort of quick decisions. Apologize, Your Honor. Try to slow down a little bit. Um, but I think the question is, all right, let's, you, you've ruled Roundup in, okay? And then you're, then you're at the process of analyzing all the different risk factors. And this person has exceeded your exposure threshold um, in terms of Roundup or Dr. Roundup. Okay. And no other significant risk factors are present. The question is, at that point, do you automatically um, conclude that it is Roundup um, that is the substantial factor causing the NHL? Or is there some other analytical process we need to go through before reaching that conclusion? Yeah, I think. To determine that you know, there's no other risk factor present. Thanks, Your Honor, for clarifying. So, I mean, as a clinician, I would never make any determination automatically. It's just not the way our clinician brain thinks. We'll have to be very analytical in each particular case. So that threshold that we talked about is important for me to rule it in, as you just described. Then I go through the process of all other risk factors. And if I, everything is ruled out completely, um, it will be very hard to ignore the possibility that it was a contributing factor to that particular patient. It's, again, analogous to all other diseases that we are trained for, cardiac disease, other types of cancers. If, if, a, if, a, if a person develops a, a heart attack and you can't find any risk factor and there's hypertension, you, you, know, you may not be, you know, you can't say that hypertension did not contribute to the development of heart disease. But I do think it's very critical to go through the analytical process to be convinced that not just only the particular uh, compound met the minimum criteria that I believe as a clinician needs to be uh, achieved, but it's very critical to rule all other factors. And I think a lot of time need to be spent in making sure that none of these factors actually contributed to the development of non-Hodgkin lymphoma. And then I'll have to use the additional literature, maybe the uh, other experts that look at toxicology data, at animal studies, and then I make my determination whether this is contributing or not. But um, I guess the question is, once you've gone through your analysis and you've ruled out other risk factors, does 
that automatically means I'm not talking about the case of smoking. I'm talking <coughs> about the case of Roundup. Once you've ruled out all the other risk factors, does that automatically mean, in your opinion, that Roundup will be deemed a factor that causes the case to be dismissed? I guess I'm just a little bit um, need clarification when you say automatically what it means because, again, as I think of things, I just don't just necessarily just say, okay, for sure it is. Right. What I, what I mean is I don't mean automatic in the sense that you're not doing any thinking or analysis. Uh, I'm saying after you've done your thinking and analysis regarding whatever risk factor it is and you've ruled out the other risk factors, um, is it, could there be a scenario where you've ruled out all the other risk factors but you haven't ruled out Roundup, but you would nonetheless conclude that you cannot conclude that uh, Roundup is a substantial factor in causing the person's death. Does that make sense? Yes, it's, uh, it makes sense, and it would be very difficult to exclude Roundup at that point. I think it would be very difficult to be aware of a risk factor that I believe it has a link to non-Hodgkin lymphoma and somehow ignore that risk factor and say, okay, I've ruled out all the risk factors, but I'm going to treat this particular risk factor differently. Despite my knowledge of the association, I'm just going to believe it's not related. So if I've done the analytical method appropriately and I ruled all of the other risk factors and this patient does have non-Hodgkin lymphoma and there is evidence of the exposure, and um, I, I would not rule it out. I will keep it in. So, so stepping back from um, Roundup and MHS, when you're conducting an analysis like this, you've got, say, you rule in five potential risk factors, and then you rule out four of them. Yes. Left with one potential risk factor. Does it matter how strong a risk factor that is before you conclude uh, that that risk factor caused the disease? Absolutely. I think there have to be evidence that I'm convinced with that to start with, in order for me to even put these five risk factors in, you know, you have to be convinced as a clinician that all of these factors have evidence in the literature that they should should belong in that big basket that you are putting in. But I, but I, and I understand that. But I, I would assume, and maybe this is, in, maybe I'm assuming this incorrectly. But I would as, assume that you put in risk factors right at the outset, and some 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 um, risk factors are stronger than others. Absolutely. Um, for example, you get lung cancer from a variety of different things, working in an asbestos mine, smoking, and then some lesser cost. Sure. And you might rule all of those in at the front end, right, when you're looking at a patient's history. Am I right about that? Sure. Then you look at the weight of the evidence and rule things out. And so if you, you know, if you, if you rule out a bunch of stuff and you leave one, but there's one risk factor remaining, I assume that you have to ask before concluding that this is the factor that caused the person's cancer, you, you would have to ask how strong is that factor? Yes, you have to look at the how general. Is, how strong is the evidence that this, uh, that this exposure causes this particular cancer? Absolutely, you have to look at the general evidence about this particular risk factor, and you have to be convinced that the evidence is strong enough for you to keep it in despite the epidemiologic threshold that you talked about. I agree with that, 100%. Does that mean in this context, coming back to the Roundup NHL context, that um, whenever a patient has been exposed to Roundup above the threshold that you've identified, and whenever um, you've ruled out all the other risk factors that you would never conclude that we don't know what caused this exposure. You would always conclude that it, it was the cancer. Well, so, so it, it's my opinion that the evidence that links Roundup to non-Hodgkin lymphoma is strong to start with. And I obviously recognize the other folks in this courtroom that disagree with me, and that's why we're here. But the premise, and it's my opinion, that the evidence that links Roundup 
glyphosate to non-Hodgkin lymphoma is actually strong. And I, as you know, Your Honor, I've looked at the literature and I've reviewed the literature. I've testified to the literature, including some papers that did control for other pesticides exposure, such as Beirut 2003, and we talked about this previously. So my opinion is that the evidence is actually strong between non-Hodgkin lymphoma and Roundup. And so therefore, your answer is yes, that in that hypothetical scenario that I, that I uh, spun out, that you, you, you would always conclude that the Roundup caused the lymphoma. If I ruled out all the risk factors, and I believe, as I told you, in my opinion, that the evidence is strong, in my opinion as a clinician, it would be inappropriate to ignore a risk factor that I know is strong, and I know the literature supports it, in my opinion, and more than happy to go through all the literature again. But again, I believe the literature is strong with, with this. The link does exist, and the risk to ignore such a risk factor as a clinician would be inappropriate, in my opinion, from a clinical standpoint. And again, not to keep comparing other diseases, but you know, there are there are lung cancers that occur in non-smokers. We know that. Not every person who gets lung cancer is actually a smoker. But if you have somebody who smokes, and it will be, will be hard pressed as a clinician to say, okay, I know you smoke, but I still think your lung cancer is idiopathic. But the evidence of the link between smoking and lung cancer, I assume you would agree, is much stronger than the evidence of the link between Roundup and lymphoma. Well, I would think 30 years ago that evidence was not strong. In 2019, I think you're very correct that the evidence is strong. If we back slash, if we back to 30 years ago, there were a lot of people who would disagree with you, and doctors were actually smoking in the hospital in medical rounds. We have pictures of that. So that may be accurate today. And um, But if you had said that to somebody 30 years ago, they would laugh at us. They would say, no, no, there's no evidence of that. So, you know, uh, it is my opinion that the evidence is actually very strong between non-Hodgkin lymphoma and Roundup. And as a clinician, I cannot ignore that. And again, I recognize that we may disagree on some of these things. Some people might say there's evidence, but the evidence is weak. And some people may say there's evidence, evidence is strong. I belong in the camp that says the evidence is strong. And I promise you, 30 years ago, many of us did not think that smoking was linked to any cancer. And it took a lot until now, nobody even disputes that. So as part of your, I mean, this is, this is not so much of a question for you as a comment that I might talk about with your lawyers later, but I'm thinking about somebody who either has not offered a, a general causation opinion or somebody whose general causation opinion is excluded from the literature. There, you know, there's going to be a question about how that is, pres how the specific causation opinion is presented to the jury. And I assume what it will be for somebody like Dr. Kanan, assuming he testifies, is that um, he is adopting an assumption based on the testimony presented by the general causation expert that there is a link and that the link is strong, right? And that, and that with, the, with the specific causation experts, you're not going to be think you're not going to be getting into, I don't know, this is, this is more of a question than a statement, but I, I think you're not going to be getting too much into how strong the link is. That's, you're going to have to borrow that from the general causation experts. Does that sound about right? Yeah, so, so our three specific causation experts that we've proffered fit into three different categories, right? We had Dr. Weisenberger who, who passed through general causation. We had Dr. Naban who actually reviewed all the literature and has the knowledge base, but for X, Y, or Z reasons wasn't able to give a general causation and Dr. Shustoff who didn't participate at all. So absolutely with respect to Dr. Shustoff what you just said and also with respect to Dr. Naban to the extent they don't ask him about it. I mean his knowledge base you can't erase his mind from what he knew and what you know the, the studies and the testimony that he previously gave. Um, but we but will. If, but the, but, but what, the way they would ask it is you're not here today to give an opinion how strong the connection is between glyphosate and gel, you're adopting an assumption based on the specific causation testimony that 
Lord said, "Don't worry about it. Just keep on doing it." And that's not always happy. It's not always good for us to be to be on the mission with God. Yeah, I mean, if that's the way Monsanto presents the question, then yeah, that's the way that he would probably respond according to your orders. I mean, this the whole bifurcation uh, system that we've set up um, has sort of created some wacky. <laughs> Uh, testimony issues and that we'll need to work through with you. But yeah, I mean, he's a unique witness because he did participate in phase one. He does have all the knowledge base. He was, for example, just using the Andreati 2018 paper, the AHS paper, which is going to be central to Monsanto's defense, I assume. He presented his own expert report on that, was deposed on that individually. Um, you know, Your Honor didn't necessarily say he, he was struck in total about that, but if that comes up in a specific causation Testimony. How are we supposed to handle that? I mean, this this is some stuff that we're hoping. Right, to get but I assume that that is how. I don't know if this is the subject of a motion in limine or not, but but I assume that that's how it's going to be handled. If Monsanto is going to pursue this bifurcation theory, they would be adopting the assumption that that is okay. They would be adopting the assumption that that is strong, but it will be up to the general causation experts to testify that they have done the work and that they have seen the yeah, sure. Um, absolutely. However, you know, on cross-examination, if he's asked a question and that's part of his answer that he's reviewed that study and he has, you know, criticisms of that study or, you know, why did he use McDuffie and Erickson, which use dose response and AHS also uses dose response, he needs to be, to be able to explain his opinion of the AHS study and, and, and why uh, he, you know, he weighted certain things in different ways. And, of course, he has a superior knowledge base of that because he's been participating in phase one and phase two. Well, obviously, that's not an issue that we have to hash out now, but it's certainly an issue that's hanging over all of this discussion. Okay. Sorry, you can continue. Yeah. Well, Dr. Navan, using <coughs> the, the, the discussion you had with, with um, His Honor, you have a hundred plaintiffs who you rule in glyphosate because it meets the exposure threshold, and then you look through all their medical records and you find no other what you would call causative risk factors. And it, it, the conclusion here is, for all 100, you would not say you wouldn't be say, well, some of them are idiopathic. You would say for all 100, it was a glyphosate or Roundup was a substantial contributing factor in all of their cases, correct? Idiopathic, by definition, it means you failed to find any cause. Idiopathic is not a cause. Idiopathic, by definition, it's a term that us physicians like to use just to sound smart. Whenever we say something is idiopathic, it means we have looked at every single cause under the sun and somehow we failed to find a cause. So that's what it, it I understand we have to always rule out idiopathy, but when we say we rule out idiopathy, it means we didn't find any cause. That's really what it means. So, so if you have an actual cause that you know is linked to a particular disease, to ignore that cause and say, I still believe that this particular disease is caused by something I don't know, although I have something I know it causes it, how could this be done from a clinical standpoint? Right? I mean, as a clinician, when you're sitting in front of a patient, if you already know a particular compound causes a problem, can you actually look that patient in the eye and say, despite my knowledge that this may have caused your cancer, I still think your cancer has no known cause? So before he uh, pu pushes back on that, I just want to make sure I understand. So, so to use the terms that I was using, you rule in five glyphosate cases, okay? And then you go through the process of analyzing the evidence and looking at the studies and so forth and so on. Um, are you, it sounds like what you're saying is you would never conclude that it's idiopathic unless you rule out all five of those cases. As long as one risk factor is present, you would always conclude that it's not idiopathic. Yes, correct. idiopathic by definition, it means that as a researcher or as a clinician, you were unable to find any cause 
for this particular disease. It's synonymous of somebody at the age of 35 having a heart attack and there's absolutely no reason for it. And you looked hard and you can't find a reason. Sometimes we don't know why a particular disease occurs. And if that's the case, we call it idiopathic. But in a heart attack example, like somebody who's 35 and has a heart attack at this point, might there, there be a scenario where you say, well, you know, you were, you know, you smoked half a pack a day for five years and you had a heart attack. And, you know, you drink, you have, you know, six drinks a week. And, you know, you don't get quite as much exercise as you should. And there's some pounds over weight. And there, so there, there's any number of things that might have caused your heart attack, but there's nothing that really jumps. And those are all risk factors for a heart attack, but there's nothing that really jumps out. And so I have to tell you, we just have no idea why you had a heart attack. That's a good question, but that's not idiopathic. You already identified various risk factors that this person has. He is an ex-smoker. He did not exercise. He has weight gain. And it's possible that maybe none of them by itself caused the heart attack, but maybe combined, they actually led to this person having a heart attack in their 30s, and I've had my share of younger people who did have diseases. But you've already identified all of these risk factors. Idiopathic in that example would be somebody who is in their late 30s, who exercises, who is fit, who is not overweight at all, who's never smoked, who has no family history of heart attack. That's idiopathic. That's when you look and you find nothing. But in the example you provide, Your Honor, it's not idiopathic. You have enough risk factors in there that you cannot ignore. So forgetting for the moment about the word idiopathic um, and, and just using the example that I gave you, um, are, are in, in that example, might you say to a person, look, there are a number of risk factors that could be at play here. There is no one that jumps out in particular. And so we cannot attribute your heart attack to any one of these risk factors. Yeah. We just don't know. It's possible. You could say maybe maybe none of them really jumps as the most offending agent that or, or risk factor that caused your heart attack. But maybe all of them together, they led to this. But there's no question before that person in their recovery, you are going to tell them to exercise and stop smoking and lose weight. Because in your mind as a clinician, you know that this somehow led to this disease. But you're correct. It's possible that none of them necessarily jumps at you as substantially really causing it. But collectively, all of this together were risk factors. And so would you always conclude that, that collectively those factors caused the disease? And I mean, maybe the answer is that this is kind of an artificial discussion because when you're treating a patient, you're not trying to figure out what caused the disease, you're just trying to figure out how to prevent it. Absolutely. Prevent him from, you know, or prevent a recurrence of the problem, right? But um, would you ever say, you know, would you always say, well, it must have been all of these things in combination that caused your heart attack? Would you say it that way? Or would you say, we just don't know? might have been these risk factors in combination that caused your heart attack. It might have been something else. We just don't know. Right. So all we know is that these are risk factors, and so you should change your behavior to try to prevent the risk factors. Right, but, but we know these risk factors is different than we just don't know. That's what I'm trying to say. We just don't know means that I've looked at everything and I found nothing. That's when we say we just don't know. I don't know what happened. But the in this example that we're talking about, we know that, each of these risk factors by themselves could cause the cardiac disease. We just don't believe you had any of them long enough or you've done any of them substantially for me to attribute that this is only the reason. But it is possible that all of these risk factors collectively led to your heart attack. Again, I think maybe you know the terminology as a physician, when we talk about idiopathic, it means you have done everything possible in your power as a clinician and reviewed the literature, and you can't find a reason. It's when somebody goes to a doctor with a skin rash, you know, they're going to go through everything in their mind. Maybe you've got an allergy. Maybe you have eczema, whatever it is. They go through everything possible to know what the skin rash is from. 
And if they can't really find a reason why you had the skin rash, they'll say, no, I really don't know why you had the skin rash, but let me just give you a hydrocortisone cream so you could stop the itching and the rash would go away. This just happened with my dad last week. I mean, the doctor just had no idea why it happened. But that's idiopathic. It's a rash that we don't know what it is. So yes, I do look at the possibility of idiopathic. I think what, what probably is important as a clinician and a researcher is, is it possible that maybe other factors in the future that we will find out that we don't know about today in February 2019? That in five years from now, we may find that there are other things that may lead to the development of non-Hodgkin lymphoma. And if we're having this conversation again, we would rule in other risk factors that today I'm not aware of. But, I mean, as an example, there are many things that we rule in now that we weren't ruling in 10 years ago because we, our knowledge is expanding. We know a little bit more today, thankfully, than we knew 10, 10 years ago or 20 years ago. So maybe in five years from now, you can't, you know, you can't rule it in or rule it out because now you have more stuff that you put in the basket because we knew more about what may cause a particular disease. Did I answer your question, Your Honor? Okay, so Dr. Kavan, going back to my hypothetical, you have 100 patients, 100 plain, patients or plaintiffs, and glyphos, they, they exceed two days per year and 10 lifetime days of Roundup use. So you have ruled in glyphosate, and you find no other causative risk factor. So, so no um, viruses or HIV or radiation, nothing that you would say is causative. For all 100, you would say that Roundup was more likely than not a substantial contributing factor in the development of his or her lymphoma, correct? Without looking at a particular case, I'm going to have to say correct. But I, I, again, I just want to reserve the, the issue that it's, you, you always have to look at each patient, each medical records, talk to each patient. It's just not, you make it sound so simple, and it's just not as a simple process as, uh, as, it, as you describe. Now, you agree that every methodology has an error rate, right? Every methodology has an error rate, yeah. I mean, depend, if you're talking statistics, not every methodology is a statistical test. Statistics have error rate, alpha error rate, and beta error, yes. But uh, So you'll have to explain to me what you mean by that. Sure. Because well, I was asked about this question in my deposition about error rate previously, and I, and I can explain to you what I assume you mean. Okay. Well, your methodology has an error rate, right? I mean, you, out of those 100, you might be wrong about some of them, right? Do you mind repeating the question, please? Sure. Your methodology has an error rate, correct? The, the error rates exist in statistical tests. I mean, again, so, you know, the, metho the methodology that I applied was not a statistical test. It's a simple thing that we actually teach residents and fellows and students, and we, are, we learn about this in medical school. When you sit in front of a patient and you're trying to determine causation, you look at all risk factors that you can think about, that you have learned about, that you read about, and then you do the process of elimination. You start looking at each particular individual risk factor. That's the methodology. It's not a statistical test that we are doing. It's a differential etiology, so it's not statistics. Well, let me ask it a different way then. You agree out of those 100 patients that we just agreed upon, you might be wrong about some of them, that glyphosate wasn't the, the, the risk factor that caused their lymphomas, correct? You can never be 100% certain of anything, but you have to exercise your clinical judgment. At the same time, you can't really ignore, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, again, it's, it's, and I don't want to keep bringing examples, but you could have a smoker who gets lung cancer not from smoking, right? I mean, you could not. I mean, you could make an argument that not we just said not every lung cancer is caused by tobacco smoking, and the reality is when you have a smoker, you are going to say this is probably smoking related because it's a risk factor. But is it possible that this lung cancer patient may have had for whatever reason lung cancer even if he wasn't smoking? No one really 100% knows. You're asking for 100% certainty, and all I could tell you is more likely than not. All I could tell you is with high degree of medical probability that I've always, that I've always done. That's what I could tell you. 
to that smoking analogy that you just used, you're applying the same reasoning here. In other words, smoking is is likely you have someone who smokes. You have a hundred smokers. I yes. Mean, just do hundred smokers. A hundred of them get lung cancer. How many of these hundred are you going to tell them? I don't think it's smoking related. If you bring a hundred oncologists today, and you face them with hundred patients, all of them are smokers. Which how many oncologists will say I don't think smoking was causing the lung cancer? That's what you're asking for hundred percent. And what I can tell you is. The majority of oncologists will say that it was smoking related. That's what we operate on, right? And my question is, using that and smoking analogy, you are doing the exact same thing here with the glyphosate or Roundup and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, correct? So in that analogy, you still have to put the other risk factors for lung cancer. And, and his honor just mentioned asbestos and other things, for example. Again, you do the same thing. In the methodology that we are talking about, you have to rule in all risk factors that you know as potential cause for this particular disease. And then you start the process of elimination by looking at each particular individual risk factors. Some risk factors are very weak, such as, for example, when somebody tells me age causes cancer. No, it just, cancer is more prevalent in older people. It doesn't cause it necessarily, but we just happen to have cancer more in older patients. It doesn't mean age causes it directly, and some of them are stronger. So that's how we start the process of elimination until you either left out by with nothing, and then it's idiopathic, and you don't know the cause, or you left with one reason, and then it's the contributing factor, or you maybe left out with three reasons, and then you have to decide whether one of them was more contributing than the other two, or the three of them were contributing the same rate or whatever. That's how that's the methodology that we do of differential etiology. It's something we taught about and we are taught in medical school and we teach the new generation of how, you, how they do it, if they are looking at causation or at etiology. The problem is, unfortunately, a lot of people are more focused on treatment, which is appropriate. A lot of times when you're dealing with a cancer and a patient comes in, you really just want to get the treatment and have the plan and proceed. So there are times where you know, physicians, clinicians are guilty as charged by not spending enough time trying to investigate causation or etiology for particular cancers. Right, and you and I have met before, and you told me you've never told a fellow oncologist or pathologist that he or she should, that you believe that glyphosate or Roundup is a cause, a general cause of lymphoma, correct? I have never said that, no. You've never said that to a medical student, correct? I've never said in the, that in public. I actually didn't know that I could say that because I thought in a litigation process I'm not allowed to say that, but I guess that tells you how much I know about, the, about law. You said it in open court, right? I understand, but I just didn't know that this is something I could go and tell other people. So, But I have not, correct. Okay, so let's talk about other risk factors in the process that you just described. Um, just because a patient has another, has, has a separate risk factor from glyphosate or Roundup, that in your methodology does not eliminate glyphosate or Roundup, correct? You, you put everything in, but some people might have other risk factors that are more pressing than Roundup. Well, let's just use active hepatitis C as an example, okay? Active, define active hepatitis C so we make sure we're talking about the same thing. Sure, H hepatitis C, that the, the, aren't, the virus is active in the bloodstream at the time of the cancer diagnosis, okay? So if the virus is still present in the blood at the time of lymphoma diagnosis. Correct, and it's, it hasn't been treated yet. So we're not talking about Mr. Hardiman, who sure. we'll talk about later, okay? Even in that situation, you would say that you couldn't rule out glyphosate or Roundup because you can have multiple causes of lymphoma, correct? You may not be able to rule it out, but you may be convinced that the hepatitis C is more important factor than, than the Roundup in that situation. Again, and that's where the issue is. If you have somebody with active hepatitis C and is using Roundup, it is possible, again, depending on each case, it is possible that in this particular scenario that the hepatitis C itself was um, more contributing or equally contributing, or they're both of them contributing, and you really can't assign a weight to either one of them. I mean, it's possible that you may not be able to tell which one is more. Right, you would, you would in, that, in this hypothetical, still say that Roundup was a substantial contributing factor to the development of the patient's lymphoma, correct? 
you could still say it's probably a substantial factor, but it's possible. Again, you can't you can get out. You have hepatitis C now that is active of this particular patient. So hepatitis C is obviously another substantial contributing factor for this particular uh, patient. Right, you if it is active and it's not treated and it's replicating in the bloodstream. Right, you would say that they were both substantial contributing factors, correct? You could say both, and it's possible that one of them be more pressing than the other, depending on the exposure history, depending on how many years was exposed, how many days, how many hours in a day, and the hepatitis C situation, how long the hepatitis C was in the body, the viral load, the RNA load, all of these things. Was there really any evidence of organ damage with the hepatitis C? Is the cirrhosis advanced? Is the cirrhosis not advanced? You have to look. I understand the hypothetical piece, but it's really very difficult without knowing the details of the exposure in that hy hypothetical example and the details of the hepatitis C because not every hepatitis C is created equal and not every exposure is created equal. But again, both of them will be in the basket. They are ruled in. And you'll have to decide as a clinician, and on each particular case, in each particular risk factor, the hep C and the Roundup, which one, if any, was more pressing than the other. But under your methodology, using active hepatitis C or using HIV positivity, you could, it is your methodology that you could have two or three causative factors in a, of an of a individual patient's lymphoma, including glyphosate. Correct. You could have more than one cause of factor, correct. In a particular patient, you could have more than one cause. Okay, now let's talk about the three individual plaintiffs. First of all, for all three, you agree that absent exposure to glyphosate, they could have developed the same non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, correct? Yes, they could. We, anybody could develop non-Hodgkin lymphoma. And in, now specifically talking about the three plaintiffs, so we're not talking about hypotheticals. For each of the three plaintiffs, had they never been exposed to Roundup, you would say that their non-Hodgkin's lymphoma was idiopathic, is that correct? You want to go each with each one? Sure. Let's start with, with and maybe Mr. Hardiman's different. So let's go backwards. Let's sure. start with Mr. Gabayu. If Mr. Gabayu had never been exposed to Roundup, and you've now looked at all of his medical records and his risk factors, you would say that his non-Hodgkin's lymphoma was idiopathic, correct? I would say we don't know the cause. I mean, again, he was diagnosed at an older age, and it's in a common, again, patients get diagnosed usually with this disease at the median age over 68 to 70. So. I would say that he was diagnosed with a non-Hodgkin lymphoma that I don't know exactly what causes it, okay. which is most non-Hodgkin lymphoma. I've said that many times before. The majority of non-Hodgkin lymphoma that are diagnosed are of unknown cause. We have 75,000 new non-Hodgkin lymphoma a year, the majority of which are of unidentifiable cause. Some of them we know the cause, and the majority we don't. But so the answer to my question was yes, right? Yes. Like now let's sometimes I like just to explain what I mean because, I mean, you've showed me a couple of things that were not clear what I meant. I think we can tell you like to explain what you mean. Um, let's talk about Ms. Stevick. Ms. Stevick, same history but never exposed to Roundup. You would say that her lymphoma was idiopathic, correct? Yes. Okay. Now, Mr. Hardiman, and you tell me, would you say that his lymphoma was idiopathic or would you say that his lymphoma was caused by his hepatitis C exposure? I don't believe his lymphoma was caused by hepatitis C exposure. He did not have active hepatitis C. There was no virus in his blood whatsoever for eight, nine years prior to the diagnosis. Um, so it's different than the hypothetical example that you provided me. Um, so again, I, I, it, would, it would be, it, it, in my opinion, hepatitis C did not cause his non-Hodgkin lymphoma, and if it did, and there's something that, again, it ha may have contributed, it would be a very minor contribution of that just because of his particular scenario. So, his, in, this, so in Mr. Hardin's case, then, you would say the same thing as you said with Mr. Gabayu and Ms. Stevick. Had he never been exposed to Roundup, the cause of his lymphoma was idiopathic? I believe so, yes. 
Okay, so um, you have also offered opinions in a case involving a plaintiff called Jack Hall, correct? Yes. Okay, and so can you look at, um, we're shifting topics a little bit, binder, the, the um, first binder would be exhibit. Are you, could I ask you a question? Did oh. You a question. Yes, of course. Are you off of uh, Hep C as it relates to Mr. Hardiman? I was going to come back to that okay. in a moment. Okay. Um, in which volume? In volume one, exhibit 2010. So you have to go in a little bit. Yes, 2010, I see that. Okay, and this was a plaintiff's disclosure of expert witnesses in that case. It involved, at the time, two plaintiffs, Ronald Peterson and Jeff Hall, correct? Correct. And this wasn't a document that you drafted, but you can, well, first of all, Your Honor, I would move um, Daubert Exhibit 2010 into the room. Thank you. No problem. You've seen this before, correct, Dr. Nathan? It's been a while. I mean, I, I'm, I have seen it at some point, but I haven't seen it recently. Okay, and this disclosed on page one that you would be an expert in this case, correct? Yes. And then if you turn to page two, about six lines down, it summarized what your opinions in that case would be. It said, he will explain his opinions regarding general causation that Roundup exposure can cause non-Hodgkin lymphoma, and specific causation, that Roundup use was a causal factor to Mr. Peterson's and Mr. Hall's lymphomas, correct? Correct. And with respect to Mr. Hall, um, that was true at the time. That, well, let's look at the last page. The last page puts the date that this was disclosed of March 1st, 2018, correct? Under the Certificate of Service, do you see the date, March 1st, 2018? Yes, I do. Okay. And so as of that date, March 1st, 2018, it was true that you were going to say that Roundup use was a causal factor to Mr. Hall's lymphoma, correct? Yes, and I recall this actually came up during my deposition. I've had, um, I mean, prior to this, the, I, the medical records and the exposure history and all of the history pertaining to this particular patient we reviewed uh, with counsel that uh, retained me with this firm. So we've talked actually about all of things pertaining to this particular case prior to, prior to me meeting this patient and so forth. So I was aware of a lot of things pertaining to this particular individual, as I explained in my deposition in this case. Because a lot of times if I get asked to look into a case, I have a lot of questions that I ask even before anything is sent or reviewed in terms of, you know, how old is the patient? What type of lymphoma did they have? Tell me about the exposure history. What are the comorbidities? What, what is the medical history? What type of lymphoma it is? What type of treatment they had? And so forth and so forth. I recall this came up and we clarified it during the deposition. Right, you're anticipating where I'm going. It, um, so let's just walk through, let's break that down and walk through the history. As of March 1st, 2018, you had not yet reviewed any of this plaintiff's medical records, correct? I don't believe I had the actual medical, physical medical record at the time, if my memory serves me right. I believe that we went through everything pertaining to the case that I needed to know that are very important and very relevant. It's like when somebody calls you as a clinician for a second opinion, and I've had my share of second opinions when patients call me or when other physicians call me. They call you on the phone and they say, I'm seeing this patient, this is the history, this is the treatment, this is X, Y, and Z, and you, you go over all of these things and say, okay, you know, I would like to 
meet this patient. I would like to review additional records. I would like to take a look at additional information pertaining to this patient. Okay. So kind of analogous to that. Right. And just to be clear, when you say we had, um, we went through everything in the case, the we is you and counsel for Mr. Hall, correct? Yeah. I was asked to take a look at this case, and I asked a lot of questions pertaining to this case because, again, there are situations where I was asked to look at patients, and I said, I don't believe that this particular individual has um, a lymphoma that is related to Roundup. So there's really no point for me to review 4,000 pages of medical records if I already determine prior to the review that there is no causation between that Roundup and this particular lymphoma. So that's, I mean, there are patients I've looked at that I did determined their lymphoma is not related to Roundup. Just to be clear, Dr. Navan, you spoke to plaintiff's counsel, you, and then based on that, you were willing to opine that Roundup was a substantial contributing factor in Mr. Hall's lymphoma, and you made that determination prior to reviewing any medical records or any other core original documents in the case, correct? I made that determination with the premise that I'm going to still review the additional records. However, again, it's not that I had a two-minute phone call conversation and, and this is how it happened. That is actually not – the way you're portraying it is in, incorrect. We've, I've, I've had several phone call conversations pertaining to this particular case where I asked pinpoint – Can I interrupt you for a second? This line of questioning is not completely – if you have whatever marking you have after that question. If he had said yes to that question, I was ready to move on. Um, can I – nonetheless, I'll just, for the record, move Exhibit 2010 into the record. That's fine. I yeah. kind of doubt it would be admissible at trial. And oh, I, I agree. I doubt this line of questioning would be appropriate at trial, but any objection? No. No, Your Honor. I wouldn't – I would – I agree with you on trial. This, I think, goes to his methodology. Um, so now let's talk about Mr. Hardiman's hepatitis C. I'm done with this. Yes. You might – Need other exhibits in there? So keep the finder, but we're not looking at that document. And you have reviewed documents that show that Mr. Hardiman had, um, his doctors have called chronic hepatitis C, correct? I have seen some um, some records that, that uh, said chronic hepatitis C. I don't believe he actually had chronic hepatitis C the way we define chronic hepatitis C. Chronic hepatitis C, it means that despite that there's still actual virus that you're able to detect. That's what's chronic. He had cured hepatitis C. He had hepatitis C at some point prior to the treatment, and then he received appropriate therapy that cured his disease. So the proper way to label him would be history of hepatitis C currently cured. But I have seen some of these documents that you are alluding to. Well, let's break that down a little bit. The first medical record that you – you reviewed all of Mr. Hardiman's medical records, correct? I have. And the first medical record that you have is dated in 2005, correct? Yes, I believe so. So you have no medical records from the 1960s to 2005 for Mr. Hardiman, correct? I did not see that. Okay. And so you have no medical – and you know that Mr. Hardiman developed cirrhosis of the liver, correct? He had mild degree of cirrhosis at the time – in 2005 when he presented – was a mild degree, I believe. Okay. And you are aware that the latency period for the development of cirrhosis that is associated hep with hepatitis C is, on average, decades, correct? Yes. I mean, some people would quote 15 to 20 years in terms of starting cirrhosis. But the degree of cirrhosis sometimes give you an idea as to the potency of the hepatitis C in this particular individual. So you have to look at that as well. But you're correct. So it takes decades to develop cirrhosis. Okay. And you've also reviewed – and, and I don't need to go into detail about what they are, but the risk factors that Mr. Hardiman had in the 1960s for, um, for, for, ha for, for developing hepatitis C, correct? I did ask him questions about some high-risk behavior pertaining to how he acquired the hepatitis C. Right, and you're aware that those risks – you need to be exposed to something to contract hepatitis C, correct? Yes, you don't acquire it from thin air. Yes, you have to be exposed to something. Right, and you are aware that in his history, the time that he was most likely exposed was in the 1960s, correct? 
Yeah, I mean, I believe that's where he probably contracted it. It's not really clear to me when he did actually have the hepatitis C. I think you and I know that we we don't know. We can only assume that it's been decades because um, obviously it takes time until you have some degree of damage to the liver, such as early cirrhosis and so forth. Okay, and so going back to your definition of chronic hepatitis C, he could have had hep chronic hepatitis C from some point in the 1960s up through 2005, correct? He would have had active hepatitis C. Again, see, chronic hepatitis C, there are some patients that you still, you know, after they acquire hepatitis C, the hepatitis C, they, you know, it still lingers around and it's still present. So he could have had the hepatitis C for many years prior to being discovered in 2005. I don't know when, but he may have acquired it in the late 60s and maybe at some point after that when he developed the actual infection. You just don't know. We just don't know exactly when, but we only can have an educated guess as to when he may have acquired it. And I, you know, I think it's possible some of the high-risk behavior in the late 60s when he may have had it. And, but you do agree that the cirrhosis of the liver in his case, relates to his act of hepatitis C whenever, whenever it existed. Yeah, I believe so. I mean, again, it was a, I think they called it mild degree of cirrhosis when he, when he presented in 2005. Okay. Now, let's look at your report because you talked about hepatitis C. That's the first exhibit, number 2000, in your Mr. Hardiman's report. Okay. And on page four, that's your discussion of hepatitis C, correct? <coughs> yes, this, this is what I discussed in hepatitis C. Okay. And I, so you discussed, first of all, you didn't have um, any, well, you didn't make any assumptions like we were talking about a moment ago about the epidemiology generally of hepatitis C from other experts, correct? I know hepatitis C is a known causative factor of non-Hodgkin lymphoma. I mean, this is well known. Any lymphoma specialist would tell you that hepatitis C is a known cause. Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by epidemiology. I, I know it's one of the causes. Okay. And then you just... I, I, I didn't need to... Um, I mean, it's something that is well known for any lymphoma specialist that hepatitis C... Oh, sorry, yeah. Got it. I apologize, Your Honor, and I've been, I verbally have been trying to be careful, and there is a motion in limine um, pending on that issue, and so I think same as last Monday, i um, been trying to be cautious about that. Um, so you might want to back up. I, I got distracted by yes. that a couple of questions ago, so you might want to. Um, first of all, I was asking um, Dr. Navhan. In, and I think you were testifying that you are very aware that active hepatitis C in, is a is a known ri causative risk factor for the development of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Is that right? Absolutely. Okay. And my question was a little bit different. You didn't have a separate um, epidemiological analysis about hepatitis C as a risk factor from any other general causation experts, correct? From general causation experts? I, yes. 
you didn't review any other expert in the case who gave you some sort of analysis of the epidemiology associated with hepatitis C, correct? No, I mean, I've reviewed um, some of the epidemiology literature myself, and I'm aware of a lot of the epidemiology literature with hepatitis C and non-Hodgkin lymphoma. I did um, recently get some of Monsanto's expert reports, um, as you know, for, um, for this case, and I did a high-level review of some of the references that they cite in their expert report, um, most of which I was already aware of, and I didn't necessarily cite all of the literature. There's hundreds of references on the topic that I think is not disputable in terms of the association between active hepatitis C and non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Okay, and so that's actually what I wanted to focus on without pulling it up on the screen. In your report on page four, you cite three studies that relate to um, hepatitis C and lymphoma, correct? Yes, but these are not inclusive. I mean, I could list hundreds of studies. Again, to me, it wasn't an issue that um, it was already known, the risk. And in fact, the first paragraph, it says hepatitis C is a known risk factor for developing NHL. So again, it wasn't something that I needed to to bring 20 references to tell you that hepatitis C is a risk factor for NHL. I've already known that, and I assumed everybody knew that. I think there's a lot of literature out there that confirms if you treat the hepatitis C and if you eradicate the hepatitis C, the risk of developing NHL is either eliminated or substantially reduced. And I just provide a couple of examples. But again, this list is by no means inclusive of everything. My, my question was very simple. You cited three papers, correct? And I'm just trying to explain that these three papers does not mean that these are the only papers I relied on or I knew of. I just didn't want to list every single paper I know of because the list would be endless. Okay. So let's first start. These are the papers I'm listing here. Okay. So let's first start in the second little bullet with the two papers you list, Pellicelli, which is P-E-L-L-I-C-E-L-L-I, -L 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 -I, and Tsutsumi, T-S-U-T-S-U-M-I. Those are two of the three papers that you discussed, correct? Yes. And both of those involved patients who received antiviral therapy to treat their hepatitis C after completing treatment for their non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, correct? Yes. And so both of those papers analyzed whether or not patients who had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma would have a relapse of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma with or without treatment for their hepatitis C, correct? Correct. And we can agree that Mr. Hart that, that doesn't apply to Mr. Hart, specifically to Mr. Hardiman in the sense that he received his treatment prior to his, his non-Hodgkin's lymphoma diagnosis, correct? Yes, but the reason I put this in is just to illustrate that the relationship between hep C and NHL, and that relationship is close enough that if you treat the hep C, you actually eliminate or diminish substantially the risk of NHL. In fact, there is a lot of literature that for some of the hep C-associated NHL, if you treat the hep C, the lymphoma even regresses and goes away. And this one, an example that this link and this association that sometimes if you continue therapy for the hep C, you reduce the relapse of the lymphoma if you have a lymphoma that is associated with hep C. So the illustration of this example is more along the lines that that link is um, strong that the antiviral therapy, when you do antiviral therapy, you even prevent the relapse. So that's how important the antiviral therapy of the hepatitis C. So if you treat the hepatitis C, you are um, preventing relapse in some patients with lymphoma that developed because of the hepatitis C. So it was just an illustration. Okay. So it was an illustration, but you agree that Mr. Hardiman doesn't fall into the subjects in, being studied in either of these two studies, correct? He doesn't fit in this particular one, no. Okay. And in the Kawamura study, which is the first study you cite, you agree that it does not discuss anywhere how long the patients who had hepatitis C infection had that infection prior to being treated? Most studies, by the way, don't have a particular... I, don't, you, and I think a good strategy for him is to appropriate it. If you feel like his question is really a long answer... Sure. ...fine, please explain. But when possible, try to answer the question first and then... Yes, Your Honor. 
So my question was, you agree that there, there were hepatitis C infected patients that were studied as part of the Kawamura study, correct? Correct. And they were, and they were then treated with interferon or a, to, to, to try to eliminate or address the hepatitis C, correct? Try to treat and eliminate hepatitis C, yes. And you do not know how long the patients in that study had hep active hepatitis C prior to that treatment, correct? I don't know that. Now, there are other studies. You said there are hundreds of studies on this topic, correct? Yes. And you ag agree that, well, first of all, let's talk about the latency period associated with hepatitis C and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, okay? Okay. Do you agree that the hepatitis C, um, the latency period associated with hepatitis C and the development of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma ranges between 5 and 35 years with an average around 15 years? It's long, yes, I agree with that. Okay. And so, just to give us a timeline for Mr. Hardiman, his treatment of hepatitis C that you are focused on occurred between 2005 and 2006, correct? Correct. And then he developed his non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in 2015, correct? Correct. And walking through, you, you said you've now looked at some of the studies that were cited by Monsanto's experts? Not all of them. And again, there were hundreds of references. I looked at some of them high level. I read some abstracts, but there were a lot of references, as I'm sure you're aware. So um, I did not look at every single one. Okay, well, let's look at, in now I think this is a new binder for you, Dr. Nathan, volume three called Scientific Literature. And let's look at tab two, 2063, which is the study called the Giordano study. Before we get into that, can I ask you a question about timing? Yes. Um, I was, uh, it, I think my understanding is that now I'm sort of talking about you know, this past year, potentially this past year. So how much longer do you have to wait to see what happens? Do you understand anything I keep interrupting? Um, uh, I'd rather have you ask the questions that are on your mind. I really think I have 20 minutes or less. Okay. I, I think what we should do then is why don't we take a 15-minute break now, and we'll come back, and then we'll, uh, and then we'll go to about 12.30, and if there's, there's more time that we can talk about that, we'll take that. Okay. will tell you that it's not going to be the case. Page four, um, no, what the, the top bullet point of page four. And you guys will probably have to go back and redo the sheet because the, the material that was submitted just doesn't seem to get overly packed in there. Understood. I understand. Okay, so, so uh, Dr. Nabhan, you can start the morning and, and we'll resume on 35 and 40. Or you can, no, go ahead. Uh, Your Honor, sorry. Uh, is it possible that Dr. Nabhan be instructed not to discuss the content of his testimony with counsel on the bench? Okay, you can proceed. All right, Dr. Nabon, you would agree with me that a genotoxic chemical causes DNA mutations, correct? Yes. And that is damage at uh, the DNA le level, correct? Correct. Which is different than damage at the cellular level, correct? Yes. All right, and, and DNA mutations, meaning when, a, when the DNA is changed, those are permanent changes, correct? Usually, yes. Okay. And it's your opinion 
that those DNA mutations don't go away when the geotoxic chemical is removed, correct? Not usually because you've already had several hits if you continue to be exposed to that uh, offending agent. Okay. And it's your opinion that glyphosate is genotoxic? Ask him what his opinion is. Okay. What is... All right. Is, is, is it your opinion that glyphosate is genotoxic? Yes. All right. And you testified earlier when you were talking to the court that not all viruses were genotoxic is what it's, I wrote down. It's my belief that viruses work differently than, um, than compounds that cause genotoxicity. The viruses have to replicate and have to be present on the intracellular level to cause the particular damage that they usually cause. If they are no longer present, that damage can, you know, doesn't, doesn't exist. Okay, so they just work differently. All right, so if you, when you, when there's damage at the cellular level, when you remove the offending agent, do the cells repair themselves? You can follow up if you want. Well, that, that, that question actually was not leading. I mean, I, I think there's a real question here about the, the witness was not able to answer my question, and now the lawyer is feeding the witness the answer to these questions. And I think there's a possibility that this answer will simply need to be excluded. Um, and actually, what, what I will say now is, is, is the answers to those leading questions are going to be excluded. So you might want to start over. Well, all of that testimony was stricken. Um, and you might want to start o over with okay. that. I mean, normally I don't care that much when you're talking to an expert. But since you're feeding the expert answers that he wasn't able to give me in response to my question, uh, I think it's particularly inappropriate here. And so that, so okay, the, I'll start the over. entire testimony on redirect is, is stricken, and you can start over. Okay. What effect does, uh, can you tell the court what, a, what genotoxicity means? And I tried to explain, and maybe I didn't really articulate that, but again, the, there are differences in how viruses work, for example, and how compounds that cause genotoxicity usually work. So the, um, you know, whenever you have damage and chromosomal breakage and DNA damage to, um, for, from exposure to a particular compound, that's how I view genotoxicity is. So you're actually having damage on the chromosomal level. All right, and so are the D is, D is DNA damage permanent? Sometimes it could be, and sometimes it's not. I mean, there are situations where the cell is able to repair certain DNA damage, and so you could see that occasionally um, someone may be exposed to a particular compound or a toxin, but the, the repair, um, the mechanisms of how the cells repair themselves are still intact, and they may actually work. And sometimes it's not, and usually it's not if you have the continued exposure to a particular offending agent, that continued exposure lead to affecting the cellular mechanisms of how they repair themselves. A lot of the cancers develop when the cellular mechanisms to repair the ability of imbalance between growth and cell death is no longer there, whether it's a mutation, whether it's a gene that is overexpressed, underexpressed, but ultimately, something happens that leads to that balance between cell survival and cell death to be affected or impacted. With continued exposure to particular toxins, to particular agent, that mechanism of cell repair is, uh, is impaired. And that's why sometimes you see that in particular toxins. In viruses, it's different, as I explained, but I, it just seems my explanation is not uh, adequate enough. What I said in viruses, if the virus is no longer there, the ability of the virus to cause that damage is no longer present. Now, the question becomes, could the viruses cause damage that is already permanent, that it doesn't matter if they are there or not? And my opinion is not. They have to be present to continue cause that damage. But that's, that, that's what I said. And is, is that because the virus uh, damages at the cellular level? Uh, oh. oh. All right. Does, does the virus cause damage at a cellular level or at the DNA level? Again, the, 
the most viruses, when they cause damages, they cause damages on the cellular level. They're not really necessarily causing the, uh, the uh, chromosomal breakage and the chromosomal aberration and the genotoxicity. And that's why there is a critical difference in how viruses cause oncogenesis, which is development of cancer, versus other compounds that may be implicated in causing cancers. So when damage occurs at the cellular level and the offending agent is removed, what happens to the cells? Most cells are able to, to repair themselves. I mean, again, that's really where the, the issue is. When you remove the, these offending agents, such as viruses, you might be able to, uh, to repair. In fact, we, we went over several studies earlier, and there are many others where if you treat, again, if you treat sometimes the virus, and you don't treat the cancer, so you just treat the virus, and there are examples for HCV as well, you might have regression of the actual lymphoma. So there are studies that looked at treating HCV. When you look at HCV-associated NHL, there are several studies that treated the HCV alone without treating the lymphoma, and some of these lymphomas regressed and remission occurred because you're treating the underlying virus, because the way the viruses work, they have not caused a permanent genotoxic damage that you cannot repair. It's just the way they work. Okay. No further questions. Could I ask you, I'm looking at Monsanto's binder of studies. On your honor. Okay. Pull up uh, exhibit number 2052. Yes. I have not looked at this study before. Okay. Um, well, I will ask you, you can take your time and look at it, but what I want to point you to is page 98 of that study. Um, and if you look at figure four, page 98, um, it talks about alternative uh, mechanisms um, of transformation. Um, and I, I was wondering if you could take a couple of minutes to look at that chart, look at the paper to the extent you need to, and see if you can explain that to me. And if you can't, that's fine. I I'm just reading the abstract first, then I'll look at the figure if it's okay. abstract. I'm going to look at the figure right now. Take your time. I can try my best to explain. Okay. So, you know, again, in the 
in the abstract, the author just acknowledged the fact that we're still not really sure what, how, how it causes, um, how, what's the mechanism. So they talk about, um, again, just to mention. The me mechanism by which uh, hep C causes MHA. Right. So they talk pathophysiologic processes at stake leading from HCV infection to overt lymphoma still need to be further elucidated. So at least they acknowledge, and this is 2018 paper, so as of just a year ago, still that mechanism, these mechanisms are under uh, investigation. They acknowledge three mechanisms, essentially. One of them is the chronic antigenic stimulation that usually occur. And the chronic antigenic stimulation, it means that there is an actual virus present that causes this continued exposure to the actual cell. So um, you have on the figure that you point out, figure four, on the left-hand side, you have chronic infection, so the infection is present. You have sustained B cell activation, so because the virus is present, it continues. And that was one of the things I mentioned earlier. You continue to have this B cell activation. In essence, once you remove the infection, that activation is no longer present. So, you know, but that's one theory. So you have the continued activation, chronic antigenic stimulation, and that leads to somehow to lymphomogenesis, and they have a arrow to notch pathway mutations with a question mark because at some point some of these low-grade lymphomas that occur might have something that lead to transformation. We don't know actually what transforms them. The rates of transformation is about 5 to 10 percent per year. But, you know, they're, they're suggesting maybe some cellular pathway that gets mutated or affected that lead to the transformation. So would that reflect the point at which you might still slightly later to uh, be diagnosed with NHL even after you've been treated for the virus? No, this actually doesn't, this suggests that you need to have the chronic stimulation. So you have to be able to have constant stimulation of these cells with the chronic hepatitis C infection in order for you to develop the marginal zone lymphoma. And what it's saying that if you develop low-grade lymphoma, something might occur later on to transform into DLBCL because we know that patients with indolent lymphomas such as marginal zone could transform to a more aggressive lymphoma such as DLBCL. Right, but what I'm saying is if you develop low-grade lymphoma, it might transform to DLCBL, excuse me, DLBCL, even if you've already been treated for your, for your hep C. Yes, you could. Yes, transformation does occur about, rate about 5 10% per year. Okay. If you look at the uh, right side, it's a little bit of a different uh, hypothesis, and uh, they acknowledge it's a little bit highly speculative on the on the page before, which is HCV positive follicular lymphoma, a third pathogenic pathway, and they say it's highly speculative, but they propose it. And what they essentially say is that because they found cells in patients who are HCV infected who have the BCL2 oncogene expression, which is usually in patients who have the 14, 18 chromosomal translocation. See, um, they speculate the hepatitis C infection through chronic inflammation would favor the G-series entries. So in other words, there are patients who already have the, um, what they're trying to look at, Your Honor, just to be clear, we level set, they're trying to look at the transformation. So that's why they have marginal zone on the left and they have follicular lymphoma on the right. So these are two indolent type of lymphomas, and they're trying to see how HCV might be implicated in the transformation process versus the one in the middle, which is de novo. I just want to make sure we clarify that. So on the left side, it was chronic antigenic stimulation. It's there stimulating the B cells, might lead to low-grade marginal zone, and then we don't know why it could transform. I've seen patients who transform 5 to 10 percent per year, that's what the literature supports, and they're saying maybe there's a pathway that gets mutated, although it's not proven. On the right-hand side, they're looking at a different type of indolent lymphoma, which is follicular lymphoma. And just to level set, follicular lymphoma patients usually have the 14-18 chromosomal translocation. The 14-18 chromosomal translocation leads to overexpression of BCL2, which you see in red on top. BCL2 is a proto-oncogene, so when it is present because of the 14-18 chromosomal translocation, it leads to overgrowth of cells. So what they're saying now, we have these B cells, so somebody already have these cells, and we see that they have presence of the BCL2, 
and then they have the in chronic infection with HCV, and they have G-CRE entries. So somehow there's uh, a, an environment of inflammation because of the presence of the HCV and antigenic stimulation that allows these uh, BCL2 cells, the 14, 18 cells, to keep re-entering and not leave. And by doing that, they lead to the development of follicular lymphoma, and then something happens that might lead to the transformation into DLBCL. But I have to look what this AID question mark is, the one on the right. Um, they don't say what AID is. One second. But, but I, I look at the AID, but the point is that follicular lymphoma could transform also to DLBCL because of, this is maybe another pathway or something that just leads to the transformation. Okay. Um, the theory in the middle, I believe, it looks at the possibility of looking at direct transformation and involvement into uh, patients with uh, DLBCL, which is not the two theories they are proposing. So the one on the left and the one on the right are the two novel mechanisms that they believe uh, they may be causing. These are the two theories that they are bringing in, and they're saying maybe there's, there are these two alternative theories that we are bringing in. So if you look on page 96, they have HCV-positive marginal zone and DLBCL, two distinct models of HCV-related lymphomogenesis, and um, they talk on second paragraph, it's now established that chronic external stimulation leading to protracted stimulation of antigen-specific B-cells clones is likely to constitute the main driving mechanism in marginal zone lymphoma. So you, you just really need that chronic antigenic stimulation, which when you treat, you kind of take out. You don't have this chronic antigenic stimulation anymore after therapy. Um, so the third paragraph, they talk alternative pathway of transformation based on direct HCV infection of the B cells. So if you don't have HCV infection, you can't really infect the B cells. So their theory is based on direct HCV infection of B cells, especially in HCV positive de novo DLBCL subgroup. That paragraph reflect, reflects the um, middle um, uh, chart in, that, in figure four. Yes, I believe so. So could you explain that to me? So they're, they're so the, again. Um, if you can. I'm talking. You're, you're only just glancing. Well, it says mixed cryoglobulinemia, rheumatoid factor, and VH16 PK restriction usage was in this. Oh, I was talking to myself. I'm sorry, I forgot, but <laughs> my apologies. They say mixed cryoglobulinemia, rheumatoid factor, and VH1 to 69 positive, and VK3-20 slash 15 restriction usage are indeed unusual features of de novo DLBCL. Um, no, all I can say, Your Honor, is on page 97, the first, the first paragraph and the last sentence before the HCV positive FL, what it says, Finally, the presence of viral proteins has been detected in tumor cells of HCV-positive DLBCL. Um, I'm not sure I can explain right now the middle figure that you showed me. I explained the right side and the left side, but, but I think the authors also acknowledge that the presence of these viral proteins has been detected in tumor cells of HCV-positive DLBCL, which once the HCV is treated, you really can't detect that virus. It's really in line with my knowledge as well as my training into how viruses cause lymphomas or cancers in general. Okay. All right. Uh, does anybody else uh, want to ask any follow-up questions in the wake of that before we wrap up? I just want to ask, we've had a lot of talk about uh, mechanisms of action. I want to ask a very simple question. You agree that regardless of the exact mechanism, hepatitis C can cause genetic mutations that become cancerous, correct? Yes, it can. 
And you agree that the longer an individual is exposed to hepatitis C, the more likely he or she is to have those genetic mutations occur, correct? I believe it can, yes. And you also agree that the exact mechanism by which glyphosate, in your opinion, contributes to the development of non-Hodgkin lymphoma is, is not, not entirely clear, right? There are theories, but you're right. I mean, I don't think we know 100% the mechanisms of a lot of things, including how Roundup causes non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Further questions, Your Honor? Okay. Uh, Tom, hopefully we'll catch your flight. And Thank you, Your Honor. Is there anything else for us to discuss uh, right now before we, when we meet again next Monday, is that right? Your Honor, Jennifer Moore. We just had a couple of housekeeping matters, if it's okay with the court. Um, one, we wanted to know if Your Honor had a chance to look at the jury questionnaires because we have to submit our more dire questions on Wednesday, and it would be helpful to have that before we submit the more dire questions. Off on a final version? No? Oh, apparently not, so I'll get on that today. Okay, well, I mean, if, as long as we have it before Wednesday, it's fine, Your Honor. Thank you. Um, and then, um, as part of your order, we are supposed to submit jury instructions and verdict form on Wednesday. I know we've already done that for phase one, and I assume we're going to be arguing that if there's any additional questions on the 13th. Do you want us to submit phase two instructions on Wednesday? Uh, you don't have to do that. We'll deal, we'll deal with that later. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, and, and then, um, is Your Honor anticipating any time limits on Wednesday the 13th as far as the motion for summary judgment or Daubert arguments? I'm not sure I'm in... I'm in uh, uh, a position yet to um, give you guidance on that. What time are we supposed to meet on that uh, day? I believe 9.30 in the morning for summary judgment and Daubert, Your Honor. Summary judgment and Daubert, and then we were planning on the afternoon for um, for, for the motions in limine? That's correct, Your Honor. Yeah, I mean, well, plan on coming at 9.30, and we'll address whatever we need to, we'll begin addressing whatever needs to be addressed at 9.30. I may decide, and there are certain issues, certain summary judgment issues that I am not going to hear argument on. For example, I highly doubt that I will hear argument on the failure to warn motion. Um, there, there may be others that I don't need to hear argument on. I suspect I will want to hear argument on um, uh, the specific causation um, motions, um, and I haven't. Re I only started glancing at the motions to exclude the other experts, so I'm not really sure about that yet. Um, Could we address that again on Monday, Your Honor, just to help assess with preparation? Yeah, for I can Wednesday? hopefully give you some further guidance on Monday. Okay, that would be really helpful. Um, and then in the afternoon, you mentioned motions in limine. Um, we also, um, I guess we, Brian and I, Mr. Sedgwap and I talked about this, but we have our joint exhibit list that we're submitting to the court this Wednesday. It is roughly 11 or 1,200 exhibits. And so we may meet in, <laughs> on the will use list, Your Honor. Um, on the may use list, I can't even tell you the total number on that. Uh, but one thing that we were talking about was to meet and confer to see if we could come up with categories, and that may be the best way to approach that, if that would work with Your Honor. Yes, that would that would be good. Um, okay. A couple of important categories from that list where it would be particularly helpful to resolve it in advance, and stuff that you actually know is going to come up. I mean, right. Ninety-eight percent of what you put in that exhibit list is not going to come in. I understand, right? Your Honor. By your own choice, um, so try to try to focus on the things that you are you know are really going to be an issue. And then the uh, last couple of housekeeping things, Your Honor, is on depot designations. We're submitting those on February the 18th to the court. Um, and if there are any unresolved objections, we're trying to work. We'll, we'll try to work those out before. When would you anticipate us arguing that? Would that be during the trial? That's for just for planning purposes. Uh, I don't really know. Let's see. You, you said you're submitting your dep depot designations by the 18th. The 18th yes. is President's Day, so you may want to want to submit them the 19th or the 15th. Um, that might be better for your staff. Um, I, they probably would 
prefer many things, Your Honor, but <laughs> they're not they're not getting that right now. Uh, I mean, I don't know. That's that's sort of a hard question to answer without knowing how much dispute there's going to be. I know. You know volume that we're talking about. We're, we're doing our first exchange today, actually, so we may be able to be in a better position on the 13th to bring it up with Your Honor, but we just would. That's something that we may need to do piecemeal, too. I just want to be yeah. aware of it. But if we have time on the 13th to start getting into that stuff, we can do that. Okay. That would be great, Your Honor. And then the last um, thing that I have is um, for Dr. Portier, we did speak on the break. Um, one thing um, we would be amenable to is to go ahead and do what really would essentially be a trial deposition of Dr. Portier um, that week before trial starts. If Your Honor would be available, if there are, I mean, I'm not talking about really minor things, but just objections, um, if we could have a way to contact you, um, it wouldn't be in the middle of the night, Your Honor, but if we could work something out like that, that would help us because then once we get the transcript, we wouldn't have to go through arguing about the objections because for our burden of proof, we do plan to call him first, um, so we're going to be ready to roll after opening statements on the 25th. Okay. Well, if you... But you need also need to be light on your feet and not call him first if 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 you know circumstances dictate that. But um, but I can make myself available. Um, you can work with Kristen on that on sort of figuring out when I will be available. Okay. But I assume in, for for the most part, you're just going to be making your objections to preserve them, and only if it's something big you're going to be calling. That's what I would anticipate, Your Honor. We wouldn't take your time if it wasn't something um, on a larger scale. And then we'll work out as far as when that would, when the actual deposition would occur that week, whether it's Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and we would let the court know um, through Ms. Mellon. And obviously on, you know, examining experts, um, you know, generally speaking, I've tolerated uh, more leading questions of experts I shut this this section segment down this afternoon, but generally speaking, I've been pretty tolerant of leading questions of experts during the Daubert hearings. I will uh, obviously be a lot less tolerant of that at trial, um, and I, you know, I th I think that particularly in situations where, you know nobody is challenging the qualifications of the experts and I think that's largely the case here is that the qualifications of the respective right. experts are not being challenged I don't have a problem with asking leading questions to make it quicker to get those qualifications in and maybe some of the other general background stuff like high-level general background I understand stuff. but after that if you you know if you ask leading questions of, of dr. Portier on the stuff that matters, I'm gonna. I'm not gonna allow it in. I understand, Your Honor, and so when we get to the substance, I get it. But for time purposes, especially since we have time limitations, so we can help move the record along, that would be great. Yes. Um, the only other thing I did have one thing. I apologize, Your Honor, is that last Monday at the Daubert hearing, the defense submitted a bench memo on, or well, maybe it wasn't last Monday. I apologize if it wasn't last Monday on substantial factor, and we do want the opportunity to respond to that before you rule on that phase one jury instruction, could we have until um, Friday of this week to file a response? Sure. I mean, okay. it's, I'm not sure it's necessary, but yes, you can, you can file a response okay. on Friday. Great. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. <laughs> Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. We'll see you next week.